Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, unschooling mom and author, bringing you interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free Exploring Unschooling ebook, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 43 of the podcast. It's the 26th of October, 2016, as I record this intro. And it's Q&A time. I'm so pleased to have Anne Oman and Anna Brown join me again to answer your questions. We talk about ways to move away from control over stuff while meeting our own needs, the idea of free reign as it relates to unschooling, fear and the pull between our idealized vision of childhood and the reality we're living, whether you can not do enough as an unschooling parent, pondering our role as our children get older, and the deschooling shift to seeing all the learning our children are doing. It can be really hard to remove our schoolish filters. As always, thanks so much for sending in your questions. If we haven't gotten to your question yet, don't worry, we will. We're answering them in the order received. And remember, if you'd like to ask a question, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the submit a question link. And I'm back from the summit. It was an amazing time hanging out by the beach and on the beach talking about unschooling for many, many hours with a wonderful group of like-minded parents. I love that I'm always learning more too. I feel refreshed and inspired after hanging out with these lovely and dedicated parents. Thank you so much for choosing to come and hang out with us. And I rode that wave of inspiration when I got home, planning the podcast episodes out until June of next year. That's 2017. I can't believe it's getting here. (laughs) I am so excited to share it all with you guys. I continue to have so much fun with the podcast. Thank you so much for being here with me. And a big thank you to all the people supporting the show on Patreon, especially to new patrons Matilda, Deanna Buck-Floyd, Susan Walker, and Jenny. I deeply appreciate that Patreon support. It feels like we're a family, happily sharing information with anyone who's curious to learn more about unschooling and ways to live this wonderful lifestyle with their family. You guys rock. And if you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week's quote comes from Leo Babauta in his book, Zen Habits, Mastering the Art of Change. Leo's the founder of the super insightful website, zenhabits.net. He also unschools his own children and has gathered his unschooling writing at unschoolery.com. I share a longer version of this quote in one of my answers in the episode, but I think it bears repeating here because it so often is the reason behind the fears we encounter as we move to unschooling. So Leo calls it the mind movie, you know, that ideal image we have in our mind of how things are, quote, supposed to be. He writes, As we focus on this mind movie, the story playing in our heads, we become attached to it and want it to be real somehow. The problem is that when reality clashes with the story, we get frustrated, upset, bothered, angry, disappointed. These bad feelings can get in the way of our peace of mind and happiness. They can make us behave badly and harm our relationships with others. This mismatch between the story in our heads, our mind movie, And reality causes a lot of our problems. The answer is to mindfully turn from the story to the reality of the moment. So often when we're answering questions, we encourage people to focus back on the moment, back to our reality, and not to project it into the future, nor compare it to the idealized image that we've got in our heads. When we come to see our children in the moment, to fully see them, their likes and dislikes and aspirations and challenges and motivations and dreams and nightmares, we see their incredible humanity. And it really is much more beautiful than the sterilized image we have in our heads. It really is worth the effort to keep digging. Try to keep that in mind as you're listening this week. And now, on to the questions.
Welcome to another Q&A episode. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and I'm happy to be joined again by Ann Oman and Anna Brown. Hi to you both. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, just to let everyone know, we just got back from the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit in Bethany Beach and had a wonderful time. We I was wondering if you guys five want minutes to show. <laughs> Sorry. Five minutes ago. <laughs> it feels like five minutes ago. It, does. Go, go, go. it was <laughs> even though it was two days. Anyway, I was just wondering if any of you wanted to share anything about your experience. I, I mean, I just went, it was such a wonderful week. The location was unbelievable. And the people, there was just so much love and so much laughter. And it's just, I'm still feeling very full from all of it and excited about the new connections and a lot of aha moments from people. And it was just awesome and so fun to hang out with you guys in person again. <laughs> Yeah, this was our second summit, and I, too, I'm blown away by the impact that, you know, these few days have on the lives of the families who attend and on me, because mm -hmm. uh, I'm stretched, and I fall in love with these people, and the setting, as Anna said, and just everything about our time together, it's, it's really, really special um, to be immersed in this two-day, basically a two-day conversation, full two-day conversation about this path. And with, with other people who also want to grow and learn. And that's, I can't think of a better word except how incredibly special it is. Yeah, I know. That's the whole, you know, that we learn so much too by just hanging out with people and, and these, these conversations and we really dig deep. So it's, it's always such a special experience. I think that's a great word for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have a full slate of questions for us this month, too. So would you like to get started, Anna? Absolutely. Okay, so question number one today is from Lynn. Hello, I'm a mom to four children, five and a half and under. My five-year-old should be starting prep next year, Australia, she's telling us, um, but we have decided to unschool or essentially just continue on the path that we are already on. We've always tried to have a respectful and mindful approach to parenting and our relationships with our children. This has taken a lot of self-reflection and work on my part, though, as I didn't have this growing up. Two of my current hurdles at the moment are tied back to relinquishing control. First, as the amount of things that come into our home. I'm a minimalist in the sense that I don't like to have a lot of stuff in the house. If it's not used or doesn't hold special meaning, I tend to donate it. The amount of clothes and things, etc., I own is very minimal. I feel overwhelmed when there's too much in our home. I like the order and the simplicity when there isn't too much in the house. It makes me feel less chaotic. I tend to trickle this down to my children. My daughter especially loves to collect things and her room becomes filled with stuff and is very often messy. I try over and over again to let go, to quote, allow more into our home, to not care about how messy her room is. It is her room after all. And I succeed at letting go for a bit. However, a rough moment or day arises and I revert back to trying to get the control back on how tidy her room is or how much stuff is in the house. How do I reconcile my needs and their needs? I need less to feel less overwhelmed, and they need more to discover and, and explore and learn. We can be different, but how do I meet everyone's needs? The second thing I'm having a hard time letting go of is around introducing TV, computers, iPads, video games, etc. My husband and I really only watch an hour or so of TV a day after the kids go to bed. Same with our phones or listening to podcasts, etc. It's only after the kids go to bed, since they haven't had much exposure to school quote, screens, they never really ask for it. And I've never really had to restrict it. But at the same time, they don't really watch much. A few things here or there, like a train show, they love transport, the recent Olympics. How do I and should I let more of this into our home? I guess I also struggle with content. With four children so young, I suppose I tend to worry about what they would be watching and whether or not limits should be set around that. We watched The Jungle Book as a family movie a few night, weeks ago, and my three-and-a-half-year-old has been terrified of monkeys come to into his room ever since, and my five-year-old asked for it to be turned off after the building collapsed on top of the ape. So I question how much free reign I should give in regards to content. The other noise that comes into play are the studies I have read regarding TV's, quote, addictive nature, and 
that most shows are too fast for young children, etc. Any help and advice and suggestions you have to offer would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and then there's a quick follow up. Hi there. I forgot to add that I think part of restricting what comes into the house in terms of volume also comes out of the fact that the more there is, the more I have to clean and tidy. The kids help to an extent, but with them being so young, to a large extent, most of it falls on me, as you can imagine. There are they are they still need a lot of help with a fair bit. So how do I let go of stretching myself without let, stretching myself too thin? So okay, Whew. <laughs> that was long. <laughs> Hello, Lynn. So I actually had another thought that I didn't think of earlier, but let's see how this goes. Um, I think I'm going to start with the things portion of the question. You know, because I'm also a person that likes my space to be pretty orderly. I find that it is calming to my brain when I have clear spaces. But I also live with three other people who see the space very differently. Um, my youngest was the biggest collector I had ever seen when she was young. Dolls, books, snow globes, bottle caps, old clothes, trash. Yes, like actual wrappers that we would throw away. Nope, not throwing those away. Things like that. And I just found ways to help her keep all of her treasures. You know, we looked at bins and shelves and different options so she could keep these things that were so important to her. And honestly, I assumed that she would always be like this. But as she's grown, that's really changed to the point where I find myself that I'm saying, but but remember this, sure, you don't want to keep this. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's really shifted. Um, but what I see in looking back is how those things really served a purpose for her. And I'm so, so glad that I didn't put my filter over her process. You know, I may never know exactly what she got out of all of it, but I know that it was important to her. I can see how critical that was just in her processing of who she is and how she wants to organize her spaces. Um, you know, as for me, I would carve out a space or spaces for myself. Oftentimes that's the kitchen and where I have my computer. Um, so those spaces would remain clutter free. I like the kitchen clean because I like to create meals and I do that better when it's kind of a clean palette. And I like my computer space and my writing reading space to be clutter free again, just because my brain works better that way. But those can be like small little tucked in spaces wherever I, and they, those for me switch around, around the house. Um, you know, and that gave me the calm that I needed and helped me feel joyful about my space, but also gave the others in my family the ability to keep their spaces in a way that worked for them. You know, I have friends who collect and have what can look like to me on the outside, really chaotic spaces. But I find in talking to them more about it, it's completely orderly and makes perfect sense to them. And with so many in your household, Lynn, I think you're going to run across all types. I think it's just a matter of um, respecting those differences and working together to find ways that feels good, you know, for everyone to have their needs met. Um, as for the TV and games, I don't feel like this is something you have to introduce at a particular time. I think things come up organically. And for some, you may find that it's a passion area and for others, it may not be. The issues that we talk about here are more about restricting something that someone loves. It doesn't sound like it's something of interest now. And I find it really helpful to just live in the present moment around us and not worry so much about what ifs and what about later and what if they start doing this and how will I restrict? You know, that really takes me out of now. You know, it takes me away from the joy that we can be creating. So that's my thoughts on that. Anne, do you have anything? Yes, I have a couple things to add. Um, I wanted to just go from this portion of your question where you say, I also struggle with content. And I agree with Anna to not live in what ifs and everything. Um, but I just would really like to address this anyway. Um, I struggle with content with four children so young. I suppose I tend to worry about what they would be watching and whether or not limits should be set around that. And um, you don't have to see it as setting limits. If it does come up in your lives, you just see it as watching television and watching shows that they want to watch that they would enjoy. And that's where your focus needs to be, simply on their joy. Um, usually young kids don't ask to watch violent TV shows or rated R movies because they want to watch things that make them feel good and happy. And um, you can nurture and encourage those feelings. And about, um, you know, watching Jungle Book, uh, to fully be there with them and see how they're reacting is good and not like wait until it gets over the edge. Um, you can say, you know, I can feel like you're getting upset about this. Let's take a break and see if we want to go back and watch this or not. 
um, that helps your children to listen to their own inner compass and their intuition and everything. Um, when you point out to them, you know, that you can tell that they're getting tense and everything and we don't have to sit here and finish this. And that helps them to get up and walk away from something that does, um, you know, feel bad to them. There's also, there are also websites that give details about movies and you can read those. Um, they give details about everything that's in the movie from, um, you know, curse words and uh, tense music and everything. Um, so if you Google parental guide to movies, you find many different sites. And I have many friends who have always watched the movies themselves before watching it with their children uh, when they understand that their children are cer sensitive to certain things. So then you can discuss something that you saw in the movie with your children that you think they might not want to see. And my kids actually do this for me. They've seen a movie before. They'll be like, Mom, close your eyes at this part. <laughs> and then they'll be, and they'll, be like, they'll be like, no, it's not over yet. Not yet. Okay, open your eyes. So this is something that, you know, you can do with your kids if you think they'll be upset by a certain part, but you want to enjoy the whole movie and everything. And I did want to address as far as television being addictive, um, the definition of addiction is one trying to escape from the reality of their lives. And that's why people think TV is addictive, because it can appear to be that way. But when it's used as a deliberately chosen tool for entertainment, enjoyment, world expanding possibilities it's simply something that's enjoyed and our presence and our conversations and our mutual enjoyment of the shows our kids are interested in are ways that the television is a happy option in our lives one that can connect us and make our relationship stronger instead of one that causes arguments creates resentments and pushes the children away from us so if it does come up in your lives it's important to really examine your preconceived definitions about um, the television because it looks totally different in an unschooling family. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as the clutter and everything, um, I, I agree with everything Anna said. It was really great. And I also um, just want to remind you that um, your children are doing what they need to do the, to live their lives. That's their job to be unschooling kids interested in a lot of things. And yes, you both have your preferences, and you're also the adult who's here to nurture and encourage and support their interests and their questions. And I, when you said that, um, you know, you have a full day and then you look at the mess again and it starts all over again, you can be aware of how close to the edge that you are um, so that you don't have a moment where you look at their clutter and everything and you just want them to clean it up right this minute. Be aware of how you are feeling throughout the day and make a system so that it's easy for you to not start feeling overwhelmed. Use bins or whatever um, you feel like you can do to just pick up the clutter quickly or have it as organized as you can be, as you can be without infringing on their um, clutter, clutterness, their space and everything. So, um, yeah, you're the unschooling parent and they're the children. So if you could see it as your job to manage your internal guide and compass to allow space for theirs, then that's how things are going to flow much easier. Pam? Yeah. And to get to get to that point, I was just going to mention um, when I was feeling pulled back to try and control some situation, that was usually a a clue for me um, to ask myself how my children felt about the situation, to try and see things through their eyes, because um, I knew how I felt about it. It was stressing me out. I was feeling the need to control it. So um, it helped me to open up um, my mind a bit more and just try to see through their eyes rather than through the judgment that I was feeling, because that's really where um, more creative solutions lie when our judgment isn't driving us to keep coming to those same conclusions over and over and over. I need it tidy. I need it clutter free, et cetera. Um, so you, your kids are young now, but um, so you might not be able to have more much of a sustained conversation, but your daughter can probably express what it is she loves about having a full room. And you can see through your children's actions and reactions to things, what they're loving about the environment that they're in and what's getting in their way. Um, I also 
uh, got clues as to how we might mesh our perspectives together, right? Um, as as uh, Anna and Anna mentioned, um, maybe she's got lots of stuff, um, but if it's more organized, it will feel it might feel less overwhelming for you. Um, so she has her stuff, you feel better. That's more of a win win. As Anna had mentioned, maybe you can keep uh, a particular space or a particular room tidy, tidier, so that that's a place where you can go to refresh and re-energize a few times a day. Um, you can even think about the kinds of play that they enjoy that don't doesn't make much of a mess and and set up those kinds of things in there, like maybe a, a TV room or or, or whatever, um, and do other kinds of play in another room. So it's really about just having an open mind and being curious about what it is that they're getting out of their activities, um, seeing that joy, and also uh, what your needs are and trying to come up with creative ways to meet everyone's needs. So that that's kind of the fun puzzle of Unschooling Days. Right. As for the... I, yeah. I'm sorry. I want to say I love how, um, you know, people always ask, how do I resolve our conflicting needs? And we don't see it as conflicting needs. We see it as right. everybody can what they want. And because the children are the children, the parent can change their mind about it. But that doesn't mean they don't get what they want either. You know, mm -hmm. there's a way for them to shift their perspective about it and help themselves feel good about it, uh, you know, in a realistic uh, solution also. Yeah, yeah, that's what I love about it. Um, for the TV thing, I love what you guys both said. I just wanted to add, let's look at that phrase free reign when um, you mentioned free reign on TV, because I think that leads us to a bigger question about unschooling in general. The idea of free reign seems to stem from the idea that unschoolers say yes more and don't use control as a management tactic, you know, which is true. But there's a whole world between yes and no. So unschooling is about living together and engaging with our children, which is just the bigger picture of what you guys already said. Um, so when they can truly choose and make choices, they don't want to do all the things. They don't want to do those things that make them super upset or uncomfortable. And we're helping them do the things that they want to do. So as Anne mentioned, you're going to um, know what what bothers your kids and, and watch out for them. Um, find that information out. If they do want to try it, you're going to be with them, turn things off, um, close their eyes. You know, there it's so much about us being together. It's not the idea of free reign where you're letting them off to just go do whatever they want. It's about living deeply with them, exploring things together and helping them figure out what's work, what works for them, whether it's TV or games or whatever it is that, that you're feeling um, the urge to control versus free reign. You're instead with unschooling, you're living um, really connected and in the middle of that. It's not one extreme or the other. Okay. Question number two, Anne. Question number two is from um, somebody who didn't want to share their name. Uh, it says, I started out parenting thinking that we would have very limited use of TV and video games when our kids were young. I sort of built an ideal image in my mind of parenting my young children in a pretty Waldorf type way. We do art, play outside for hours, etc. I've moved well past most of that as my husband and I are almost fully embracing unschooling with our three kids, six, four and five months old. However, I'm having the hardest time de-schooling when it comes to TV and video games. It's like I keep thinking I've done that, and then I feel the fear creep back in. My two oldest kids love video games, and so does my husband, and I honestly just don't enjoy them. I try and join them for a bit each day and love spending time with them, but it's just not my thing. And I fall into the trap of comparisons. On weekends, I see all the neighbor kids outside playing together in the beautiful weather, and often my kids are inside on the Xbox or computer. I just can't get past my own upbringing and the messages from society about video games and sometimes really wonder if I will always believe that other endeavors are more valuable than watching shows and playing video games. I don't want to feel this way and I want to support what my kids love. Perhaps I'm just missing when they were younger and less interested in this stuff and also often think that four and six is still pretty darn young to spend so much time in front of a screen instead of running around and engaging in active play. Perhaps I just ask can't embrace this aspect of unschooling any advice for when these thoughts creep back in and unsettle me and make me question our approach i truly want to embrace this and to support and feed their interests but get stuck when their childhood 
isn't looking like what I thought the ideal childhood my kids could have would look like. I think I'm driving my husband crazy by using him as my sounding board every time I get worried. <laughs> I he, he came to us and gave your husband a little break. Uh, <laughs> I, I hear you say that you want to embrace this and support your children's interests. And what I loved when I was reading it again, I love how I pick up more things when I'm reading it again. Um, you're aware of what is holding you back. And that's a good thing. And what I'm seeing is that there's absolutely no space right now for you to embrace and support your children's interests because you're holding on so tightly to all of the other stuff. You're holding on to this vision in your head of what your life should look like. You're holding on to society's definitions of television and video games. You're holding on to fear. You're holding on to comparing your lives with someone else's that you can see through your window. And you're holding on to who your kids were yesterday. And so because you're holding on to all this stuff, there's no space for you to truly see your children right in front of you and who they are. And there's no space for you to see or be a part of or uh, see, be a part of or receive the incredible gifts that are in your life right now in this moment. Your children are there in front of you and you're wishing them to be younger. You wish they would go outside. Uh, you wish them to be Waldorfy. <laughs> you're basically um, wishing them to be something different than who they are right now. And because Sam ha P Pam has so much information on her website about the value of games and television in her unschooled kids, li kids lives, um, and we've talked about it on podcasts. I won't go there. That's all there for you to explore and learn about and understand. Um, as an unschooling parent, it's important for you to see the value in all the things that your children love to do. So that's another aspect for you to explore. And there's a lot out there for that. What I want to explore with you is why holding on to these things that I listed instead of seeing accepting, honoring, and celebrating the children that you have right there in front of you, probably really shining by doing what they love to do. Um, a few weeks ago at a gathering, I was talking to a friend and she brought up what you said. How um, I ha She said that I have always said that I never miss the days when my kids were younger because I'm so full of love and celebration for who they are now. I personally do. I live so in the moment with them. I fill myself up with the glory and excitement of their interests and their lives and their beings. And there's no space or inclination to wish for them to be as they were yesterday because today and who they are right now is so full of fabulousness. And she said, but I do miss how my kids were when they were little. I miss holding them. I miss not having anything else be important to us except simply be together. I miss me being the center of their worlds. And I hear you saying that too. And when she said that to me, my brain went, aha, I suggested that maybe she doesn't miss her kids when they were that age, but she longs for the days when she knew for sure what her role was as their mother. Her only job when they were younger was simply to be with them and to nurse them and hold them and talk with them and read to them. And as I say these things, I can feel her energy and I can see that this is absolutely what she values so much in her life. So back when our children are very young, our entire worlds are simply each other. And maybe what people are feeling when they say they miss those days is that they're at a place now where they're not sure of their job description as an unschooling mother anymore. Our children's lives are full of other things. And maybe we wonder if it's just our job to be cleaning up after them and bringing them food while they're playing their games. So again, back to the picture in your head. Anytime we have pictures in our heads of what we want our lives to look like versus what our lives do look like, it's time to take a look at ourselves and see what's inside of us instead of blaming the children or the thing that they're loving doing for our discomfort. And so this is our work, our job to grow and stretch and examine our previously held beliefs and expectations and definitions and those pictures in our heads. It's our work to keep up with our children and to understand they do need us at every level of their lives, every age, every stage. As our children grow, the challenges get more complex. And we think they're going to need us less, but they, in fact, need us more and more. They need us even more to be completely in love with who they are and to see them shine doing what they love to do because they'll experience things that will require that foundation within them to know that they are right and it's good for them to be exactly who they are and to follow that which they love to do. So in order to keep up with our children, 
and how they need us in this moment, we need to let go of the things that are getting in the way of truly seeing them. And nothing gets in the way more than wishing them to be different, wishing them to be doing something other than what they're doing. So let's go back to you saying you want to support and encourage their interests. First of all, just look at them. Look at who they are. This is what needs to be honored and respected and celebrated. That child that is right in front of you being exactly who they are, just bursting with shine and goodness and is really, really wanting you to see it too. And once you get to the point where you can absolutely celebrate your children for being who they are, then you'll be able to see the value in what they're doing because what they choose to do, what they love to do, come from that, the very core of their beingness. What they love to do is a part of who they are. I ha have an essay. I, I think it's on Pam's website and it's on my website too, shinewithunschooling.com. It's called I Am What I Am. And I think uh, it's a good thing for you to go and read uh, because it just talks about honoring our children for being who they are. And I could go on and on about this as Pam and Anna know, but I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could just sit and listen to you for ages, too. So that's easy. <laughs> that's weird. You've never heard it before. <laughs> I know. But like I said, we learn each time, right? It's yeah, truly it. It, it's truly yeah. important each time. Um, and I am going to just jump off that same idea. And, and I'm just going to maybe use some different words for it, because I think that is the most important thing. Um from the, this question, it's and and you you saw it already. Um, the person who asked the question uh, that you're you're stuck in that difference between that ideal image you have in your head and, of your children and their childhood and the real children that you see in front of you. Um, Leo Babauta calls this the mind movie, and I love that concept. So I'm going to share just a little bit from his book, Zen Habits, Mastering the Art of Change, because he describes it as a projector in our heads that's constantly playing a movie about how we'd like things to be, our ideals about the world, our expectations of how things will turn out, how others should be, and how we should be. These images aren't based on reality, but are just a fantasy this film projector has created from nothing. As we focus on this mind movie, the story playing in our heads, we become attached to it and want it to be real somehow. When it's in our heads, this story begins to seem real. We envision our goals as almost real. If only we could get there. We see our ideals as almost real. If only everyone around us would meet these ideals. If only we ourselves could meet these ideals. We expect our story to come true, even if it doesn't. The problem is that when reality clashes with the story, we get frustrated, upset, upset, bothered, angry, and disappointed. These bad feelings can get in the way of our peace of mind and happiness. They can make us behave badly and harm our relationships with others. This mismatch between the story in our heads, our mind movie, and reality causes a lot of our problems. The answer is to mindfully turn from the story to the reality of the moment. Learn to accept the moment, appreciate everything about it, find gratitude for it. Otherwise, not only will you find resistance and frustration, but you'll miss the beautiful moments of your life. Mindfully see the story you're playing in your head, then practice letting it go and turning toward the reality of the moment. And he suggests thinking about it almost as a form of meditation. And in my experience, as we slowly come to accept the reality of the moment, Oh my gosh, we find so much amazing stuff in there. That's that shine Anne was talking about. It does take time and, and to, to do it bit by bit and step by step instead of in one big gulp of, you know, trying to guilt yourself. But over time, as we truly, every time we just notice the movie playing in our head and mindfully shift, notice the movie, mindfully shift, we truly begin to see the reality of our children and their choices and their passions and their shine. And it really does overpower that perfect mind movie that we're clinging to over time because the reality really is so much more than we can even imagine in that movie once we can make that shift. You have anything you want to add, Anna? I do. I mean, it may be too long, but there's there's some things I can cut out because I, I think you guys did cover it so much. But um, the, the quote that came to mind for me was the idea of expectations as 
pre-planned resentment. And Mm -hmm. so I think, again, we're all saying that same thing, you know, that picture in our mind, those expectations, you know, who just let that go because it just, that's always kind of a recipe for disaster. But um, one of the other things I noticed just in reading the questions and actually it's the second time I read back was that um, new babies only five months old. And I think new babies can really change things in a family because it's, there's a lot of focus on the new baby mom's needing time to just, you know, kind of cocoon with that baby and do. And I'm wondering if this idea of like kind of longing for before is related to that transition too, because I'm, I I just have the two children, but I know when I was first laying upstairs, I, I had my second child at home with her and I could hear my other child downstairs playing. There was this moment of like, whoa, things have changed. You know, she's down playing with my mom or doing other things. And so, you know, I'm just wondering if some of that might be going on too, and that they, they are turning to this new love and this new interest because it fits in the family right now, because maybe you've had to cocoon and be around. So anyway, just some things to think about there. Um, but I also wanted to, there was another piece, da, 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 let me get to, you know, we keep seeing these questions about TVs and computer games, and I really don't think it's about that. You know, I think it's about supporting our children and following their interests without judgment and with trust. It isn't about the TV or the computer. And I think sometimes it helps for people to say, you know, if they were reading all the time, still they're not outside playing with the neighborhood children, would it be the same issue? And if it's not, then the issue is the block we have about video games, not about doing different things or getting outside or these other things we're kind of telling our story in our head. And I think that can be a really important distinction and to examine those things because then you're able to be honest with yourself and with your kids because kids really pick up on that when we're not being honest about things and not being authentic. So we're saying we want you to get outside and play, but really it's this heavy judgment about the particular activity that they're engaged in. So I think that's really important to look at. Um, You know, learning and joy can come from so many activities. And if what's happening here is that you're missing them, you know, and you're wanting to share more time and find something that feels good because you mentioned that, you know, you're not into video games, you know, look at that and kind of connect with that versus making it about the video games. For me, for example, it was um, pretend play. Okay, I am not good at pretend play. This is something I learned after I had children. Um, (laughs) I have a friend who, oh my gosh, she could be a princess and a troll and she could be rolling on the ground and she was, it was mesmerizing. But I just thought, oh my God, I'm terrible at this. You know, I'll never be able to do this. I, I tried, it didn't work. But what I ended up doing was just supporting my children's love of it, you know, and it was making costumes because I enjoy, you know, creating things and doing it was creating environments and finding other people who loved it, you know, kids and adults, you know, all of those things. But what was important to me is also finding something that we enjoy doing together. So I looked at like, what, you know, what can we do that we all would enjoy? And for us, it ended up being card games, board games, and video games, because we actually did enjoy Animal Crossing and doing things like that together. Um, Those were things I could do. And we read a lot. Some of my other friends were like, I don't know how you read for hours and hours with them. That was easy. you know, it's finding that thing that works for you and your kids because there's so many different ways we can be present and be together. And so I think that's kind of important to examine. And I think just a shift in energy away from trying to get them to do something besides games, shift that to an energy of trying to find something that you all do that you're enjoying together. I, I think they'll respond to that so much more because I think anytime we feel judged by someone, it, it sets a block. You know, we put up a wall like, wait a minute, you're not valuing what I'm doing. You know, I'm going to kind of keep you at arm's length. But I think when someone's truly trying to connect with me, not judging what I'm doing, but wants to truly be with me, that's something I respond to and and want to share my time with them. So I think just a few of those things maybe think about in relationship to your situation and see if anything fits. Can I, I just want one more thing. Anna brought up Animal Crossing, and <clears throat> I was wanted to say that you don't have to love, you know, the video games, and maybe it's the video games they're playing. And um, Pam and Anna and I uh, have our own <laughs> DSs, and um, when we were together, the three of us would play Animal Crossing together and have a great time. And it was connecting for my children and I. We would 
um, sit around together and play because you can visit each other's towns. And this is not your typical video game. If you don't know Animal Crossing, <laughs> please look into it because it's basically um, shaking trees and selling the fruit to pay off your mortgage. <laughs> and it's, it's simple and it's cute and it's adorable. And um, we, I, I have gotten so much joy from it and laughter and most importantly, deep connections with my children from sitting together with our DSs and laughing and talking about our games. So um, you may just have been going in one direction. I, th I think when we say video games, one comes to mind, you know, shoot them up video games or whatever, but there's so many options now, the cooking mama and a whole bunch of, right. you know, different right. Pokemon, anything. Um, so if you think you might be interested in that as a connection, that might be something to look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's part of expanding their world, but also, you know, in a way that you might enjoy, too. It's just being being more open and seeing things as bigger instead of trying feeling stuck and trying to pull things away and make it right. smaller. Right. Right. And not saying, no, I don't like that, but saying, hmm, this looks interesting. You know what I mean? It's 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 right. it's the possibility opens up instead of the no closing it down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's beautiful. Okay, question number three is from Sarah. She writes, can you, quote, not do enough as an unschooling parent and fail your children? Or is it about changing your values and emphasis from education to joy? I feel like I'm getting good at saying yes to the messy and strange things my children want to do, but I wonder if there is more strewing I could be doing. At the moment, I feel I don't strew very much because most of the time my children aren't interested in the things I suggest or strew, and so it feels like a waste of time. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention was um, around that phrase of not doing enough. Um, my perspective is that for unschooling, that looks like not engaging with your children. It looks like leaving them alone to figure things out. Um, Cause sometimes that can be the first impression that people get, you know, when they're like, oh, I'm trying to release control. I'm not trying to tell them what to do. And, you know, it's like a rubber band. They kind of bounce back far in the opposite direction by thinking they need to stay hands off. And, you know, you'll bounce back and forth and back and forth and, and find your place. But if you stay stuck there for too long, I can um, see how that makes unschooling much more challenging for your kids when parents don't seem to be there to help them and support them. They're just kind of leaving them alone. Um that shift that you talked about, Sarah, too, from learning to joy, I think that's really cool. It's that that I see as part of uh, our de-schooling process. Um, as part of that process, we eventually come to see that learning really is always happening. And so eventually we lose our need to look for it or, or try to measure it. And because we come to see that learning is fun and often almost effortless when our children are actively engaged and in the flow of their activities, that's when we start to see that we can just focus on that joy, that we can follow what brings them joy, what lights up their soul and beams through their eyes and everything flows from there. So that process of moving from looking for, from, you know, the educational learning stuff to the joy is all part of uh, that process of coming to unschooling. And the experience that you're finding um, about suggesting things for your children is also part of de-schooling, I think, as well, of getting to know your children. So if they aren't interested in the things that we share, it's not a waste of time. That's more information for us about them. That's information that's going to help us narrow in on the things that we might be able to find that will light them up. And also, if we're feeling disappointed or frustrated that we're not interested by these things, that they're not interested in these things, that can be a clue to us that we're attaching expectations to those things that we're sharing, that we're valuing these things over the other choices that they're making, which ties back to our previous questions. So if that's the case, that that's our work to shift and really start to see things through their eyes. Uh, Anna, what would you like to add? Yeah, I mean, I mean, not much because I think you really covered what I wanted to say because, again, it's all kind of about the connection for me. And so if we remain connected to our children, you know, we're walking through this life together. The rest, to me, kind of takes care of itself. Um, I'm with you. I think the only potential danger is the real hands-off parenting. You know, unschooling is an active, engaged process, but it's not a formula, not of 
I'm going to strew X amount of things. I'm going to check these boxes. You know, it, it's it's active, but there isn't a formula um, for yeah. about the relationships and the day to day exploration of living. You know, that presence and time together ensures that I'm there when they need me. They know where I I am, and if they want to ask questions, you know, it's just that that ebb and flow of our lives together. Then we can explore things more deeply when we need to. But anyway, so yeah, just the, basically the same. Ian. Um, well, don't be shocked, but I wrote one word after this question. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote yay, because, uh, Sarah, when you said, is it about changing your values and emphasis from education to joy? I saw that as, um, I saw the joy at your connection with them and because that's where I am with my kids and mm-hmm. my joy. So that's why I said, yay. And because as Pam said, we don't look for the learning, the edge, the learning is in the living and with your being connected with your kids and focused on joy, that's a big yay to me. And I also liked the messy and strange things that your children want to do. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was me. Yay. <laughs> Okay, so I guess we'll move on to question four, which is from Michelle. I have never listened to a podcast before yours. I love it. (laughs) I can listen while fixing dinner, doing dishes, etc. I have three boys, ages 12, 16, and 19. We have homeschooled from the beginning, only in reading and math. My 19-year-old went to high school for a semester and had a really bad experience. He now thinks he can't learn anything. We have been moving towards unschooling for five years and fully unschooling for two years. A year ago, we moved to another state because my husband was laid off. My 19-year-old had a lot of friends but really wanted a new start. He keeps in contact via internet and gaming. Um, Currently, all three boys spend all of their time at the computer, watching movies, playing games, streaming on Twitch, etc. They do not want to go out or do anything outside the house except maybe see a movie. I offer them things to do, but they're not interested. They do not want to go to homeschool, unschool groups. We had an unschooling conference in our town and no one wanted to go. I miss my boys. I go to their room and ask questions about what they're doing. They will give me some info and I will watch them play. But usually they ask me to leave. Sometimes they seek me out to tell me new developments about their games. Um, This summer I helped my 12 year old build his own computer and now he's streaming on Twitch. It seems they come to me for food and looking for clean laundry. I don't like to leave the house and leave them at home. I leave only to take the dogs for a walk or go to the store. I have been working on being in the moment with each of them and loving them unconditionally. However, I worry they will never want to go out or do anything. Um, okay, so I, I try really hard to avoid projecting things out into the future and kind of that language of all, never, anything, you know, that's kind of really polarizing language because I feel like it, it, it's a really quick recipe to get stuck. Um, things change really quickly in life and it sounds like, you know, maybe they are cocooning a little bit and that may be related to the move or it might just be where they are right now. You know, I've seen through our teen years here that there are many ebbs and flows and it really sounds like they're doing the things that they love with the people they enjoy and I know how important those online connections are. There is so much happening there that may not be visible, you know, from the outside. If they're not upset or asking, you know, for changes, you know, for me, I wouldn't worry because I can hear from your question that you're present and you're available and they know you're there and they're coming to you when they, when they want to talk to you about things. And just again, know that things change so quickly. Um, I had a teen who never left the house for a long period of time. Um, and then suddenly she was in a relationship and started traveling alone for big stretches and something I could have never predicted. Um, currently we have new jobs starting and different types of stretching of wings. And I'm guessing that all of this growth may be followed by some cocooning and processing time too, but I don't worry about or try to predict that, you know, next stage. I just really do my best to stay connected right now and available and really ready to roll with what comes next. You know, I love that our life has that flexibility and that we have the time and space for it all to end to be together. And uh, hi, Michelle. I my heart goes out to your 19 year old. Uh, mm. He had a really bad experience, you say, and he, now he thinks he can't learn anything. And that 
that that goes deep. That hurts a lot. And um, I'm wondering, you know, I, I mean, he's obviously still feeling the effects of that and everything um, because he wants a new start and everything. So relating back to what I said before as looking in the mirror at us, at ourselves and seeing what our job description is, you know, at every point of the stage, what role our kids need us in at this time. And I'm thinking right now that, um, you know, you're trying to connect with them and uh, be with them in their games and everything. And maybe right now they just need you to be their mom and to be there for them in your strength and um, validate them, validate everything that they're feeling because uh, that's re that's really important, uh, especially your 19 year old, you know, if he talks about a school experience, validate how hard that is and how that must have felt so awful. And do you understand how that feels because you were there, you know, um, anything that uh, he's loving to do, validate that, you know, wow, you're, you're getting such joy out of this. You know, you know, what can I do for you? Is there anything I can do for you? So just kind of, I would suggest to be there in that role and you're, Instead of thinking of physical things to do, then just picture yourself being there as their strength and surrounding them with, you know, your love and everything. And as Anna said, things flow. Life, one thing is sure about life and that it flows um, and changes and shifts all the time. So while you are being their strength and surrounding them with love and validating challenges and joys, the next moment could bring you to a whole new level of job description. So, you know, just breathe and, um, and be for, there for them. Pam. Yeah. I love yeah. what both, both you guys, you guys uh, were uh, talking, we're talking about. about. And I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, I was wondering if you maybe had mentioned to them that you miss hanging out with them, not at all in a way to induce guilt, but just as a way to casually share your feelings along with as you are being with them and um, validating their feelings. Maybe, you know, how we've been talking about being open to some new ideas. Maybe there are some things that you guys enjoy together that they might be up for doing semi-regularly with you as well like they're in they seem to be really enjoying um the things that they're doing right now maybe they'd be up for adding a little bit more to do something with you that you guys could enjoy together um maybe that won't happen immediately either i wouldn't keep mentioning it over and over but you know give opportunities time to materialize just let things bubble for a bit just mention that to them as well uh the other piece i thought i wanted to dig into um was or would be good for you to dig into is why you're not feeling comfortable leaving the house and doing your own things. So maybe while they're busy keeping themselves occupied and you're staying open for when they're, you know, coming to you, what are your hobbies? What things do you like to do? Um, maybe you can start by doing those things at home. Just enjoy them a little bit. Let your children see that you're engaged and enjoying your own interests too, just like they are. Um, this unschooling lifestyle is for the whole family. It's for everyone. It's not just for the kids. And then maybe you'll find that you want to venture out for a short bit to pursue them. And you can chat with them about why you're feeling a bit uncomfortable about it. And maybe with them, you can brainstorm some ways that it can work for everyone. Um, it just feels like you might be a little bit um, stuck in that place right now. So opening that up and chatting with them uh, might be really helpful as well. I, I would like to thank you for that point, because I had forgot to say that about the being there for them while doing your own things, because I just realized like my picture might have just been this hovering beingness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm for you. I'm here for you standing right here. If you need me, <laughs> if you knit, if you do anything, yes, exactly what Pam said. Um, this is another um, job description um, to uh, nurture yourself and do your things, especially when they are, really really happy doing their own together thank you pam no problem <laughs> you've got the last question i do and it is from celine uh she says our kids nine and six and a three-year-old have left school 
since February 2016. Since then, they have watched a lot of Netflix. They haven't shown any particular interest in anything. I don't see them being particularly excited to learn anything. They ask questions, but often don't even bother to listen to the answer or find themselves or find the answer by themselves. Boring is the word qualifying the research. So fear is growing in my mind. Are my kids so lazy? Yesterday, my daughter had a birthday party with five of her, of her ex-school friends. They seemed so happy to go to school. We discussed it, and they all said this year was fun. They all have a scholar activities, and they all have this energy to learn. So I thought, oh, my God, I made a huge mistake. <laughs> my kids were better off to school. We don't do so much interesting stuff now. Obviously, I feel incompetent. I am afraid I ruined their lives. It is like they are happy to not go to school anymore just to be able to do nothing. Maybe I'm completely wrong or not. I don't know anymore. I feel ashamed. I believe I was able to show them, but I am not. Oh, my goodness, Selena, I just want to hug you. Right? <laughs> I, hear, I, I hear you. I want to take those feelings of shame and incompetence and release you from them. So hopefully you'll, you will find relief from what the three of us have to share with you. And first, I do want to apologize for how very long my answer will be. So have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, your kids are not lazy. They are so wonderful. I don't even know them and I know they're wonderful. So again, see them through their own shining light as being wonderful and they are doing exactly what they want to be doing. And the value in that goes way beyond what it looks like on the surface. And that it's a really good concept for us to talk about, the surface. Because I can see you're only looking at them from the surface. You're also only seeing the surface of the other kids' school lives. And so when you don't dig deeper, you can end up seeing lack in your own lives. And I can see that you're viewing everything now through the lens of lack. And that's what needs to change. So let's look for some abundance. Let's look for the shine in your children. Feel what is coming from them when they're doing what they love to do and notice how they light up when they're doing it and when they're talking about it. That's where you want to go. That's what you want to celebrate. For decades now, when people have talked to me about feeling bad about something their child is doing or thinking they don't do anything, I ask one question. What does your child do that allows them to shine? You, you know, you can't not see their light when they're living from that joy, from the depths of who they are. So that's our job as unschooling parents to focus on that. From your uh, question, I don't have much information about the rest of your unschooling lives. So I want to take this one little excerpt you gave me and um, break it up into pieces. Talk about that. You said they haven't shown any particular interest in anything. I don't see them, see them being particularly excited to learn anything. They ask questions, but often don't even bother to listen to the answer or find the answer by themselves. Boring is the word qualifying the research. So the first part, they haven't shown any particular interest in anything. Here again, I'm going back to all I said about how the pictures and expectations we have in our heads get in the way of us truly seeing all that is happening with our children all that they're exploring, all that they're absorbing. You said your children watch a lot of Netflix. So um, yes, they have shown a particular interest in something. Mm -hmm. And it's just not the something you may think has any value. But to them, it has immense value. Your children just left school in February. Your oldest is nine. So um, he or she must have been in school for some time and probably still healing from the experience. Um, not only that, even if there's no healing going on with watching Netflix, it is a valid interest because it's not just one word. You can't just say my kids are watching Netflix. It's not this one thing in a vacuum. They're watching shows that they're drawn to. They're expanding their worlds. Um, they're seeing new things. They're being exposed to new concepts. There really is so much going on within them in the watching of a show that the word watching doesn't even come close to all that's happening with their brain and their beingness of a child during the watching. So the second part of your statement there, you said, I don't see them being particularly excited to learn anything. Um, again, yes, you do, but you're not qualifying it as learning anything. Um, real learning that simply happens from... Real learning happens from living a joyful life when our children are truly absorbing things. Real learning does not look like a child saying, I want to learn about this. 
It just happens. There's no bells. There's no whistles. And the child themselves barely recognize, sometimes don't even know. Most times I'd say don't even know that they're learning because they're focused on the joy of the living. And that's where the focus needs to be, on their joy. That's where the learning happens, no matter what they're doing. Third part, you said they ask questions, but often don't even bother to listen to the answer or or find the answer by themselves. This is one of the times when our children, we look at our children and we feel frustrated by something they're doing or how they're responding to something. And we want to blame them and say they're doing something wrong and they're lacking because of this thing, because of the way they're responding. When the truth is, again, I keep using this, it's time for us to look in the mirror at ourselves. When we feel our children are not meeting our visions in our head, really have to stop and realize Pam had that whole beautiful story about that vision in our head. It means that we have expectations, expectations about who they should be and what they should be doing and how our lives together should look. So if we turn the mirror around and you take a look at it, um, we can look at some things. What is the energy in which your children ask a question? Are they open and curious in a place of wonder, just like thinking out loud? And what is your energy when you receive their question? Do you receive it with wonder and openness and curiosity? Or do you go into a school teacher mode and do you just tell them to look it up themselves? Here's how I have answered my kids' questions. First of all, I make sure they want an answer because many times they don't. And if I give them an answer and they don't want to hear it, I still I don't blame them. I understand they were just wondering out loud. I do that all of the time. So if children are doing that, if they really don't want an answer, it's up to us to not take it personally. But if they don't want our answer because we are in teacher mode, or if they don't want to look up an answer because we told them to look it up themselves, then that's completely understandable again. Why would, it's understandable why they wouldn't want to go further with that question with us, because that feels like school and life at home should not feel like school. Learning should feel like joy at home. So how can we receive their question in the same energy in which they asked it? By being in an energy of wonder ourselves, by being curious and excited to explore with our kids. Even if I think I know the answer, I still want to shift to an energy that matches their own curiosity and wonder so that our energies can flow together nicely instead of being in conflict with each other. So when your child asks the question, you can be like, wow, yeah, that's really interesting. I'd like to know more more about that too. And if the child runs off after that, that's fine. What I usually do is um, look up the answer in my own time. And even again, if even if I'm completely sure that I already know the answer, I don't want to hand my child an answer that I received from my experience or from school or from someone else's experience. I want to get another piece of it that I got myself to hand to my child. And every single time I look up something I think I already knew, I get more knowledge about it. So then maybe later at dinner or sometime when we're hanging around together, I might say, hey, so I was curious about your question and I looked up the answer and here's what I found. And again, if the child's not interested in hearing more, that's cool. We do not take it personally because look at the gift that that child, our child's curiosity already gave to us by expanding our worlds. So sometimes these conversations do lead to more exploration. And my answer has never been, look it up. My energy has always been, I'd love to explore this more with you because that becomes an invitation for connection, for exploration, for time together in an energy of joy and ease and curiosity. And this is how unschooling flows because you will come back to that conversation at some point in the future. Even if it seems like it's not landing as learning now, it is something the child wondered about. And that's all that's needed in that moment. Even just the wonder was enough. So later on down the road of life, it will probably come back to the child and the child will wonder again and it will start all over again. But you'll both be at this new level of knowledge and your awareness about it has expanded and it just becomes something more even appropriate to the child's life. So that's just one tiny sample of one little piece of wonder that an unschooled child has the freedom to have. And when his life continues to be free, uh, continues to be full of beautiful sacred space to be and watch TV and wonder and explore, 
then those little wonderings have the space to grow into something that fits into their lives even better the next time it comes up. And so it goes and so it goes. And what matters here most, again, is the little piece of wonder, no matter how big or small it is, because it came from the core of his beingness, his own intuition, his curiosity, his voice, his brain. So I want to look at those school kids now that you are envying. <laughs> you wrote, they seemed so happy to go to school. We discussed it, and they all said this year was fun. They all have this energy to learn. What does their learning look like? School learning? It looks like somebody telling the child what they should be doing, what they should be thinking. School learning is not actually learning. It's kind of memorizing for a test and forgetting whatever it was they memorized because it has no value in their real life in this moment. So my always radically unschooled adult children and I have rarely said the word learning in all of our years of living together because it simply looks like life. Real learning looks like Netflix. It looks like video games, television. It looks like conversations with enthusiastic parents about life and the world and what you wonder about. It's, this is what's beyond the surface. I, it's the depth of their beingness. And I always completely trusted that whatever it is my kids chose to do, whatever was a piece of their wonder is a piece of who they are. And I knew for sure that it would fit into their learning through life simply because it came from them. And that's all I needed to know. I trusted in their natural learning process to know that their perfect learning stems from their perfect doing because that stems from their perfect beingness. The end, Pam. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, I love that image of, of the wonder growing, growing. Yeah, that's just beautiful. Yeah. Um, I wanted to pop in and say my, my children did go to school and my eldest was nine when they left school. And I recall my kids resisting anything that looked like school learning for many, many months, like answering questions, listening to long answers from me, thinking of things, even just in terms of research that scream school. And that is boring and was boring for them. So really Celine, what I think is totally awesome, these observations and these questions you have in that you are deep in the heart of de-schooling right now. It's your de-schooling, all this stuff. The schoolish language that you're still using to describe the situation shows that you're still seeing a lot of these moments through that lens of school. And that's totally understandable. And it's precisely why parents de-schooling takes so much longer than the kids, typically at least a year. And there will always be pockets of stuff because we're never actually done. So I, I thought I'd suggest for you this little experiment. What if you can make this shift for a while? Instead of interpreting all your kids' actions as saying they aren't particularly excited to learn anything, assume that they are already learning lots of things and task yourself with figuring out what they're learning. Because they really are learning every day. You're just not seeing it. Just like Anne said, dig deeper below the surface. So maybe this little experiment will help you start to do a bit of that digging. The other piece I think that can help with this process of de-schooling is to noticeably, noticeably make this shift to beginner's mind. As in, um, you know, releasing that judgment and, and approaching um, your days and your thoughts with an openness and eagerness and a lack of basically preconceptions of what you're seeing. As we move to unschooling, we are questioning so much of what we thought we already knew. And if we don't purposefully open up our perspective, we can find ourselves clinging to all those conventional paradigms and feeling so much fear and defensiveness and even the shame you talked about. Because there's that mismatch between that conventional mind movie that's playing in our heads and the beautiful reality that's playing out in front of us with our children. Because de-schooling is all about these paradigm shifts and it's all about us and how we're seeing things. Anna? I mean, you guys really covered most of what I wanted to say, but just as a sum up, because we can see that this comes up a lot in the questions that we've answered today, I, I want to highlight something that Anne said, and it's about the words that we're using, Netflix, screens, TV, you know, those words are not an accurate description. It's a really surface level catch-all. 
you know, what shows are they watching? What are the games? What do they love about it? Is it the story, the costumes, the drama, the history, the laughter, the comic timing, the cars, the travel? Oh my gosh, there's so much in any one show, any one game, you know, and being open and not reducing, really even dismissing their interest as screen time will go so far to enhance the connection with your kids and will also help you learn so much about your child because think of how dismissive that is oh they're watching screen again versus you know oh what did, what do you love about this or share it with me and then you find out maybe it is costumes and that they have an interest in fashion or in designing or in creating or maybe it's comic timing and it leads you to talking about other comics that are your favorites or things that they do like see how that just can open up this whole new world of connection versus shutting down when we look at someone else and kind of label with this dismissive terminology what they're doing um and i think you know related to this question again and this is just kind of a general philosophy too but like living in fear and judgment and worry just creates an environment filled with that and i think living your life with zest and love and joy and wonder and oh my gosh i love that word you know yeah. find more and more of that and and it sounds trite and it sounds you know whatever but it it really works you know it can turn things around and move you all towards new and interesting places, just saying and staying in that place of joy and wonder and connection. It, it, it's really great. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to, um, I love what you're saying, Anna, about what um, the kids might get out of the show and maybe they have an interest in costume and stuff like that. I don't want that to be interpreted by the, uh, by the parents as asking the kids what they got out of wild show oh my gosh so, yes, yes. <laughs> let's do a quiz at the end of the show and then <laughs> no. let things unfold in their own time and also sometimes kids just want to sit and watch tv and are getting yeah. enjoyment from it which is so valid in itself Absolutely. and that's all yeah all of that yep. yeah because yeah, that's the, the quizzing piece is so important. And that's why I like, I always, uh, that's why I always keep going back to seeing things through my child's eye, because then when I'm trying to do that, I'm not like um, quizzing them and, and peppering them with questions about it all. I'm just kind of observing them and imagining what they're seeing and, and seeing little, you know, and, and it's the time thing we always go back to, right? How it, um, give it time, give it time, give it time, because, you know, you notice the show they, and they're enjoying. And then two months later, they're, if it's costuming there, want to go to the fabric store or something, you see those connections through their actions. It's not like a quiz. I have to find out what they like. They like that. So we have to go to the fabric store. No, it's, you watch over time and see these things bubble up right. and, and you're and, able to support them. Exactly. And what, and when we're there watching with them, oh my God, uh, so many times I'm watching, you know, Anthony Bourdain or something with Sam and he'll be watching, he will have seen it and he'll be watching me watching it because he wants to connect with me over the things in it. So the value really is having conversations while you're watching it and, um, you know, creating space for them to say what they, what they want to say about it. Like, you know, oh my God, look at that. They're in Italy. I want to go there. You know, just comments like that. And just, there's so, so much. As Anna said in one single show, and uh, as we've all said, it's just not the surface. It's, it's quite deep and beautiful. Definitely an incredible. Well, that is the last question for this month. I want to thank you guys so much for answering questions with me because it's always great to chat and schooling with you guys. And I, I texted them before uh, we started because we'd been talking, you know, two straight days together about unschooling and it only been two days since and I already missed it. So this was uh, lovely to do. <laughs> and I missed the uh, call. <laughs> just a reminder for everybody there will be links in the show notes for the things that we've mentioned in the episode and as always if you'd like to submit a question for the Q&A show just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link and if you've already submitted a question and we haven't got to it yet we definitely will I promise <laughs> bye guys have a great bye. day bye. Bye.
Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. You can also get your free Exploring Unschooling ebook at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash exploring unschooling. If you'd like to connect, you can also find me on Facebook at Living Joyfully. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.